Hello, my name is uh, Stan Falco. I am the professor of microbiology and immunology and medicine at the Stanford University uh, School of Medicine. And uh, I want to talk to you today about a, uh, a subject of how we study bacteria, bacterial pathogens in particular, those that cause disease, uh, to try to understand more about our own biology. Uh, the picture you see here is uh, one of a macrophage, a phagocytic cell, uh, eating bacteria. And it almost looks as if it's sitting there eating a, a little bowl of peanuts. Uh, but uh, the bacteria are being taken up and they're being killed. And we often think of host parasite relationships in that way. But uh, actually, likely the first time this happened in evolution, uh, uh, the bacteria weren't too happy about it. And they began to evolve ways to resist these phagocytic creatures and uh, to them, and they began to become pathogens. So uh, as humans and most animals, we're heir to a veritable sea of different microorganisms. You see here uh, a picture of bacteria, and these are the smallest living organisms and the most numerous organisms that inhabit us. And uh, they're simple things. You can see that they sometimes have uh, organelles of uh, motility, these flagella, these large cables that come out of them. But they're fairly simple. Uh, but they're free living and they replicate quickly. We also have viruses, which are more molecular entities that uh, require entry into cells in order to survive. And they parasitize the cells and they replicate and they end up killing the cell. And sometimes we handle this burden successfully and other times we become quite ill uh, from them. Uh, in many parts of the world, uh, no longer in the United States very often, people also have uh, larger parasites. So uh, you can see here that there is a, uh, a hookworm and there are tapeworms, there's a blood fluke, uh, and there are even protozoa that uh, live in the intestinal tract. And uh, these very often uh, are silent, but sometimes they're killers. And most of you sitting there are not thinking that at this moment you may have insects grazing in your eyebrows, uh, but many of you do. And uh, this uh, little creature uh, loves to be in eyebrows and is in um, the hair and, uh, of, of many of you. Uh, and there are other kinds of insects and so on that uh, live in more intimate parts uh, as well. Uh, all of these uh, go up to make the normal flora. Mostly it's microbial cells that make up the flora. And it's important to understand that you have uh, 10 times more microbial cells than you do human cells. Uh, and uh, that tends to make us look in the microbial population uh, uh, with a little more respect than we did before, I think. Uh, most of the microorganisms that make up our flora, uh, we have never grown. We only know about them because we can use genetic and molecular techniques, but we're learning more and more about them every day. And they come in a variety of sizes, shapes. Uh, some are rods, some are spiral, some are, are uh, round cocci. And uh, there are literally thousands of these uh, microorganisms that inhabit us. And, uh, we acquire them virtually from the moment we we're born, and uh, they remain with us until uh, we die. And then uh, their last function is to consume us, uh, as it were. So the organisms that make up our flora are called commensals. And commensal means literally to eat from the same plate. So they are uh, part of us, and they share in our nutrition. Uh, they vary depending on uh, who we are and uh, our background and uh, how much stress we're under and what kind of diet we have. But in return, they do give us some vitamins, and uh, that helps us. Uh, they also are, uh, uh, are different in different parts of uh, the body. So uh, the organisms that you see, for example, in the, uh, in the upper respiratory tract, the nose and the mouth, are different than those that you see down in the gastrointestinal tract. And we can often tell what part of a body uh, organisms uh, come from just by their, their composition. Uh, one of the important roles that this normal flora plays is that it is a first line of defense 
against the incursion by foreigners, and that includes foreign microorganisms, it's almost as if they have squatter's rights. So an organism that comes in for the first time really has to be able to establish itself, and it has to establish itself in the face of this uh, mammoth uh, cauldron of organisms that are already there. The difference, then, between a pathogen and a commensal is very often that pathogens have this ability to establish themselves in a place that commensals can't. For example, uh, the liver and the spleen are, are sterile. They have no normal flora. Pathogens can get through the barrier of the normal flora and across the epithelial barrier and actually enter into the bloodstream and go to the liver and spleen. So pathogens have means of overcoming uh, things that ordinarily would inhibit normal commensals. And pathogens do this because they have an inherent ability to cross anatomic barriers or to breach defenses that limit the normal flora and, and our commensals. Uh, that distinction between pathogens and commensals is very often genetic. It's in the genes of the microorganism. So, uh, pathogens can have genes that are different than uh, those that are commensals, and I'll talk about some of those later on uh, when we discuss some specific organisms. Pathogens, commensals alike, uh, share a common landscape, and it's the humans. And uh, since Adam and Eve, we've had microorganisms. The Garden of Eden still had microbes, as far as we know. And so, for uh, uh, humans to exist, they have to be able to limit the microorganisms that they encounter. And there are really three phases of this, and one phase is the first phase is, is a very quick phase. It's automatic. It's something that we inherit, and it, it, it works at, at, at a fundamental level. There's another phase which uh, takes a while but is induced so that the uh, humans have actually evolved, that they recognize when there has been a microbial incursion. And then finally, the final phase is a, an immune phase in which uh, the host begins to make factors, usually, that will not only limit microorganisms but actually kill them and clear them. Now, the phase, first phase is called the innate immune phase, and it includes things like uh, tears. Uh, the skin, of course, is a barrier. Uh, it's like having a little coat of mail that we have around us. There is uh, acid in the stomach that we'll talk about later. And uh, there are all kinds of, a of aspects. The, uh, you have little hairs in your respiratory tract that are constantly beating upwards, and anything foreign that tries to get uh, through your nose and into the lungs is captured in a mucus film and actually beaten upwards by the cilia and, and taken out again. And we have all, literally dozens of these kinds of mechanisms that have really become part of us. They are part of us. The microbes uh, are simple, as I pointed out before, and they really have walls and uh, uh, which have certain kinds of proteins and carbohydrates on their surface. And there are also aspects, there are those organs that let them swim. Uh, there are, uh, they are studded with all kinds of different molecules. And uh, these molecules that microorganisms have are unique. That is, they're, they're, they're not found in anything other than microbes, and uh, they're never found in animal cells. And so they form the basis of how we detect microbes who go beyond the normal barriers that we permit. And we have on the surface of our cells a number of different receptors. They're called toll receptors. And uh, they are required uh, to be on cells in order for us to have a good innate immune system. And they recognize things like the molecules that make up the cell wall of bacteria. They recognize the flagella that bacteria have. Uh, they recognize the kind of nucleic acids that 
viruses have. And whenever they exist, uh, they trigger a response uh, that is local and often extreme in one sense that we call inflammation. And the inflammatory response that we have to incursion by microbes is part of our normal host defense system. So what happens, as you can see here, is that there is a signaling from uh, uh, an organism through one of these toll factors. Uh, that in turn signals uh, and calls in defenses. It's almost like a bugle call, a clarion call for defense. And this brings in phagic, phagocytic cells, the ones that are supposed to eat bacteria. And when this is successful, as you see here, uh, the microbes come and they absolutely have a feast uh, of uh, the phagocytic cells have a feast on the microorganisms. And you can see, see that here. And this is actually a picture of, of macrophages eating the plague bacillus taken in the microscope. So when all things are right, this occurs. You have signaling, phagocytic cells come in, and they kill the bacteria. The inflammatory response tends to inhibit things. In the end, uh, there are also cells which take up the final bits of these bacteria and other microbes that have been killed, and they process them so that we produce antibodies that protect us against subsequent infection. And this is called the induced adaptive immunity. And all of us have these. Normal people have a perfectly normal innate immune system and an adaptive immune system, and it works extremely well in limiting the incursion of microorganisms we, by and large, are disease-free. So the major point is that we spent an awful lot of our evolution in developing ways to stop microbial intrusion. And obviously, it always hasn't been successful. And of course, the age makes a difference, too. Young people and old people, like me, are much more likely to not have working innate and adaptive immune system, so we are more susceptible to infection. But by and large, normal, healthy adults are quite resistant to incursion by infectious agents. Now, pathogenicity is a kind of lifestyle, and it involves the fact that an organism has to enter a host. Once it's in the host, it has to establish itself and persist. It has to replicate. And then eventually, it has to leave the host and be disseminated. And in each of these cases, we're talking about a property of a microorganism that is inherited or special. Sometimes commensals and pathogens have similar characteristics, but very often the pathogen goes a little step further. So the first thing an organism has to do is to enter. And humans have nine portals of entry that serve uh, to permit pathogenic organisms to enter. And that's because we need to eat and we need uh, to breathe and uh, we need to make love to procreate. And each of these uh, provides uh, a portal of entry uh, for different microbes. And you may, I know some of you have probably paused and are counting now, trying to figure out the nine, and you should do that. Uh, but you can see that you can, uh, they can enter through the conjunctiva of the eyes. They come in the ears. If uh, the skin becomes broken, they can uh, enter that way, or even insects can do that. And uh, they can come in in any number of places, the holes, as you will, if you will, that communicate uh, us with the environment. So once an organism enters, it has to be able to find a unique place to live, as it were, a niche. And very often, the organisms have on their surface things that permit them to attach, but often they have to get there first. So many organisms are modal, for example. And uh, well, I almost got hit there by this flagella. And uh, you can see they swim. And uh, it's a marvelous molecular motor that goes and lets these uh, creatures swim around in us. Uh, and uh, they often use that to swim through mucus and through other barriers to get to the surface uh, of cells where they want to be. Uh, they have to stick. And you can see here cells that are sticking. 
to uh, bacterial cells that are sticking to epithelial cells. And you can see it's an intimate uh, kind of uh, interaction. And indeed, it almost appears as if the organism is, is being caressed by the cell, uh, or vice versa, if you will. So this is a very close relationship between the microorganism, the host cell. The host cell has to have a way to resist this. An organism that's a pathogen has to have a way to overcome it one way or the other. And it can do it by secreting things or actually uh, going ahead and trying to overcome the host defense mechanisms and can avoid it. It can hide, it can mimic. Uh, for example, some bacteria you see here are surrounded by a, a, this carbohydrate. It's called a capsule. And it's, uh, in essence, the microbe surrounds itself with something for all intents and purposes that pre prevents phagocytes from picking them up. And it's almost as if you're trying to pick up a piece of soap in a shower. The phagocyte tries to grasp the organism, but because of the capsule, it slips away. It can't grasp it. So many organisms have capsules. And indeed, the organisms that usually cause pneumonia and meningitis are characterized by the fact that they have these slippery capsules that prevent phagocytosis. So that's one way. Some organisms actually secrete different kinds of enzymes and toxins that, that allow this organism to spread through the tissue, or they paralyze the immune function. And I'm only going to talk about one organism here, the streptococcus, the common organism that causes strep throat. And it secretes a variety of different enzymes that uh, gets rid of DNA. It affects the ground substance that you have in cells, the hyaluronidase. The hyaluronic acid makes up the extracellular matrix. The bacterium dissolves it. And it produces a number of kinds of toxins that will kill cells. Uh, and uh, these things that are molecules that adhere to things like epithelial cells and literally punch holes in their membranes. And all of this can conspire under the right circumstances so that someone will have an infection. The streptococcus goes too far. And you see here the classic case of blood poisoning, where the streptococcus has made it through the epithelial barrier, entered the lymphatic system, and is now moving through the circulation up and could kill this patient. Usually that's not the outcome, but it's the difference between an asymptomatic infection and disease. Some organisms literally breach the surface of epithelial cells and enter. And this is a picture of an organism, Salmonella, causes food poisoning, actually breaching the epithelial barrier in the intestinal tract. And when you look at a, at, at a culture of Salmonella that's approaching epithelial cells, you see this uh, almost as if the cell is excited. And it ruffles because the salmonella is actually inducing motility in it and making the cell reach out and ingest it. And you can see how the organism really in this vicinity can enter the cell. And so uh, why do bacteria and, and viruses invade cells, and all viruses invade cells, and many bacteria do? Well, they get away. They, they don't have immune uh, surveillance anymore. So th there are no toll scepters uh, on the surface, although there's some inside. It's better food inside, free from competition of all those normal flora that are outside. And sometimes they use the cells as a way of moving from one place to another. They, they are able to enter cells because they can recognize specific receptors on the cell that are normally there, that are there to internalize molecules. And the bacteria and viruses have learned how to attach to these by having molecules on their old surface that makes basically the cell take them up uh, normally by a normal mechanism. So the microorganisms that are pathogens actually know how to trick the host cell into taking them up. Now, once they get inside, what are they going to do? We, our cells have been programmed that they take up particulate material to put them in, uh, in machinery, the endocytic machinery, 
which is designed to break things down and, in fact, in the case of bacteria, to kill them. But different pathogens, whether it's salmonella, the uh, tubercle bacillus is another one, and the organism causes Legionnaire's disease, each of these has a distinct kind of strategy to enter the cell and outwit the endocytic pathway so that they're not killed. And indeed, they use this as a new kind of residence where they can replicate in the safety of being within the cell, or sometimes they actually will break out into the cytoplasm. And there is a lecture in this series by Julie Theriot where she describes how organisms break out of vacuoles and actually move around inside cells. Uh, all of these are ways that the organism can uh, get inside, persist, and escape immune surveillance and replicate. Now, one of the most common ways that microorganisms use to subvert uh, the host is to produce poisons, toxins as they're called. Uh, sometimes bacterial components are poisons in themselves. So the, the outer surface, the cell wall of gram-negative bacteria, one kind of organism uh, characterized by things like E. coli, the enteric bacteria, are actually components that are recognized by the innate immune system and triggers inflammation. Uh, the molecule that does that is called lipopolysaccharide, or LPS, and it has a moiety on its surface uh, which is called lipid A, which is really uh, the toxic part. And when this is recognized uh, by the innate immune system, as I indicated to you earlier, there's an inflammatory response. If these microbes get into the bloodstream, sometimes this inflammatory response goes too far. Uh, and what happens then as a result of this toll-like inflammation is that you end up with things like meningitis. And this is a picture from an unfortunate infant in the uh, pediatric intensive care unit at Stanford who has uh, meningococcal meningitis. And uh, the presence of this endotoxin in her bloodstream has literally caused intravascular coagulation and the loss of blood supply. And very often, unfortunately, children who have this will lose their limbs. And it's because the host has responded to a normal component of, of a microbial cell in, uh, uh, in too exuberant a way. Some toxins are uh, affect different parts of our cell biology. This is another toxin. This is botulism in an infant. And this is called the floppy baby syndrome because botulism toxin has an effect uh, where basically the muscles become flaccid. Uh, bacterial toxins are among the most potent poisons that are known. From a biological standpoint, however, they're favorite tools of cell biologists because they're extraordinary in their variety and their mode of action. And, uh, example, you, uh, there are those that uh, go at the surface of the cell and they punch holes and the cell basically bursts open. Uh, there are some, for example, that affect the cytoskeleton of the cell and uh, they make the cell trafficked in candle the organisms around. The, the bacteria can motor around them. There are those that paralyze the signal transduction so that the cell doesn't know how to signal that it's been invaded and tell the immune system, come rescue me. And there are all aspects of the normal cell biology that uh, we have that are detected and utilized, if you will, by the microorganism for its own purposes. So pathogenic bacteria and other microorganisms interfere and manipulate for their own benefit the normal functions of host cells, and uh, they do so in a variety of ways. So. The whole issue for a microorganism is replication. Every microbe sitting in its mother's flagellum learns that the first thing that it must learn to do is to replicate. And so when you watch microbes replicate, they do so by simple binary fission. And you can see that you simply become surrounded by them over a period of time. Now, watching this and knowing that this doubling occurs every 20 minutes, and if it went on freely, 
uh, a single microorganism would literally grow to something that was about 23 times the volume of the Earth if it actually was permitted to go unfettered. That, of course, doesn't happen. But it gives you some idea of why a surgeon fears even a single microorganism falling into a surgical field and why your mother told you to always clean out a wound. You don't want these dangerous kinds of things in you. But this is what microorganisms do. They have to replicate. So the whole thing from entry and all the steps that it has to go through has this one function in mind, replication. Make more of yourself. And the reason that organisms to make more of themselves, it's either to persist or it's to go to a new host. So sooner or later, if you're a microorganism, the host is going to die. And it's got to find a new susceptible host. And organisms very often will induce their exit from the host in a variety of ways. So here is a sneeze uh, that you can see in slow motion. And all of these little droplets carry a, a multitude of different organisms. But there are normal features. The gastrointestinal tract is a source of the single largest source of microorganisms in our body. It is often the way in which microbes are transmitted uh, from person to person because everybody poops. And organisms recognize this and therefore utilize this as a means. And that's just not as trivial as it sounds because the organism, having lived inside the host and been comforted in the warmth of the host and the warmth of cells, now goes into the cold, cruel world and has to be able to survive there long enough to be taken up by another susceptible host. So it's a cycle that has to persist. Now, I've told you about each of the steps, entry, uh, attachment, and persistence. Uh, outwitting the host defenses, replicating once it's outwitted them, and then being passed on. But organisms, in order to do this, have to have other means. So they have to understand where they are, and they use molecular ways to do this. The surface of a microorganism is very simple. On the other hand, it can recognize things like the pH, the temperature, the amount of oxygen, uh, and it knows where it is by that and it turns on and turns off particular functions depending on that. The other thing to keep in mind is that microorganisms, and particularly pathogens, respond to a host's biological and social behavior. So microorganisms are opportunists in one sense. Well, let me tell you about them. There are many diseases that I consider diseases of human progress, and uh, they actually constituted uh, some of the more important uh, medical uh, crises in history, Legionnaire's disease, toxic shock syndrome, of course, HIV, AIDS, Lyme disease, more recently, E. coli, hemorrhagic fever, and most recently, bird flu. These are all things that are involved where the humans and their behavior played a major role in this. Let me tell you about Legionnaire's disease. When Legionnaire's disease first came out, it was considered by many to be a massive hoax. No one understood how a group of veterans meeting in, 17, uh, in 1976 uh, could have this suddenly this new disease, uh, and they thought it was a result of, of uh, a variety of conspiracies and what have you. But they, and some people just thought it didn't exist. It was just made up. Now, actually, the organism that causes Legionnaire's disease is called Legionella pneumophila. And Legionella, we now know, actually likes to live in fresh water and grow in protozoa. And that's where it's been for millennia. So it grows inside of amoeba. It replicates there, makes lots of different numbers. And it makes new numbers. It kills the amoeba, bursts out, goes looking for another amoeba. That's what it really do, does in nature. But we've changed over time. We now take showers. We didn't 50 years ago. Anyone going to a supermarket watches what happens when the vegetables are being sprayed. Uh, we have aerosolized everything around us. And by aerosolizing, we have put Legionella in small droplets uh, to now be 
more available than it ever was before. And we are older than we were before. So Legionella found itself its way into the respiratory tract more and more frequently. And a human alveolar macrophage looks pretty good as compared to an amoeba. Uh, they actually are probably related in some way in the, in the past. And therefore, this organism that usually lived in freshwater protozoa is now getting breathed into lungs. It's going into the alveoli. Uh, and being eaten by macrophages, and in the right host, under the right circumstances, it replicates and causes pneumonia. There were other things. Toxic shock syndrome was an issue in which women were changing, and they demanded products that were different. And companies responded by coming out with new kinds of tampons, for example, that gave women more freedom. It, they didn't require changing as often. They were made of new kinds of chemical compounds. This turned out to be an opportunity for staphylococci that colonize the vagina in some women. And this new opportunity for the organism to replicate, because that's what they want to do, ended up causing a disease that had not been seen before and considerable human misery. The tampons were taken off the market. The disease disappeared. If we now look at more recent history, we find out that we are really still witnessing a human microbial work in progress. There have been all kinds of new diseases that have emerged all over the world. And we've had SARS. We've had hemorrhagic E. coli. We have, we have more food poisoning than we did 50 years ago because our methods of distributing food have changed over that period of time. All of these things are changes in our behavior and our culture, and these are things that microorganisms use to their advantage, with always the idea, find new ways to replicate and become disseminated. So organisms that are pathogens and evolve and they share the experience. So microorganisms, many of you may know, have different ways of sharing information, either by using DNA molecules uh, by actually having cell-to-cell -cell contact, a kind of fundamental or simple kind of uh, conjugation or, or sex that occurs where uh, genes flow from one organism, the donor, to another, the recipient. And sometimes viruses are used uh, and to uh, transfer genes. And what we now understand is that often a commensal can become a pathogen because pathogenicity sometimes evolves in genetic quantum jumps. And we recognize now that often there are blocks of genes that are transferred horizontally from one organism to another, uh, which in entering an organism becomes part of its genetic characteristic, an island. Uh, some people, uh, and they come in different kinds of, of forms. Bacterial specialization, by and large, is a result of the inheritance of blocks of different genes. And in the case of pathogenicity, they're called pathogenicity islands. And so we now recognize the difference between some commensals and some pathogens is the fact that they've inherited blocks of genes. So for example, many of you may know that E. coli is a common member of our normal flora. On the other hand, E. coli is the most common cause of urinary tract infection. The difference between an E. coli that causes urinary tract infection and an E. coli that inhabits the bowel is because the E. coli, which is a urinary tract uh, specialist, has inherited a number of different blocks of genes, different pathogenicity islands. And it permits it to encode specialized structures that permit it to attach to the bladder or to the kidney and to establish itself there. And so that's the difference between a pathogenic E. coli and a commensal E. coli. It is important to keep in mind that disease, which we focus on, need not be the outcome of the host parasite interaction. In fact, it's usually not the outcome. And very often, we're talking about an instance in which we have uh, 
what is called the, the uh, iceberg concept of infectious diseases, in which people who actually have infection are in the small, a small number relative to the total number of people who are infected. So it's like an iceberg, only a small amount is on the surface, those are the people who are ill. Most of the people who encounter organisms uh, escape without any knowledge. And different parasites are different ways. So uh, polio we think of as being a terrible disease, but actually the relative number of people who become clinically ill who have polio virus are few. On the other hand, uh, if you look at measles and, uh, and so on, uh, you end up with infections in which everyone may be infected, but only 50% actually show signs of illness. And there are some diseases like rabies where everyone who gets infected, as far as we know, will sicken and die. The most common organisms that cause disease in humans, among them Mycobacterium tuberculosis, which in the developing world probably infects uh, a very high proportion of people. Ninety percent of the people who are infected with the tubercle bacillus are asymptomatic. They are infected by the organism, they carry the organism with them to their grave, but they never show symptoms. The organism that causes typhoid fever, 80% of the people who acquired this never show signs of illness. We know they've had it because we find antibodies in their blood that indicate that they have. I'll tell you in a while about an organism, Helicobacter pylori, which uh, infects most of the world's population, at least in the developing world, yet about 80% of the people never show any, any signs or symptoms. So disease is the exception rather than the rule. So pathogenicity is a reflection of an ongoing evolution between a parasite and a particular host. If we understand this and how the organism establishes itself, overcomes our defenses, we learn a great deal about the pathogen, perhaps how to treat it and how to prevent it from infecting by making vaccines. But in the process, we also learn about ourselves. And that is one of the great joys of working with pathogens, because you hope that you can help cure things, but you also are in a place where you can discover new things.